Hello everyone! Welcome to the first week of our lesson on Psi 115. And for this week, we're going to discuss about the introduction to physiological, biological psychology. So you might be asking me, sir, what's the difference between biological psych and physiological psych? Physiological psychology is actually a subdivision or a subdiscipline of biological psychology that studies more on the neural mechanisms of perception and behavior. So this focuses more into neuroscience, about the brain, about the nervous system. When we say physiology, it is a study of the cells, the different structures and functions of an organism. So it focuses more on its tissues, the organs, and the different parts of an organism. So, uh, biological psychology is hence defined as the branch of psychology that studies the biological foundations and implications of behavior, emotions, and mental processes. So, it focuses more on the different biological implications of our body that corresponds to the human behavior. So, it focuses more on the functions of our body and its processes involved that affects one's human behavior and cognition. Okay, so physiological psychology studies many topics relating to the body's response to a behavior or activity. Now, this concerns the brain cells. This is composed of the neurons and the glia, the different structures, the components and chemical interactions that are involved in order to produce actions. No, So, um, it actually focuses also on different um, topics like hunger, thirst, sleep, emotion, um, digestion, ingestion, senses, reproductive behavior, learning, memory, communication, okay, psychopharmacology, the different neurotransmitters. Of course, we're going to discuss about vision, about audition, also about temperature regulation, and the different neurological disorders. And of course, so much more. We'll discuss a lot of things. So let's proceed to the historical highlights of biopsych. So biopsych started before on the um, procedure as what they call or what is known as trepanation. So trepanation or trepanning is actually um, an intervention that was done 7,000 years ago by our earliest transistors. It is where they drill holes in the skull. So there are actual archaeological evidences that this type of brain surgery existed long before. Okay, another thing is from the Egyptians. So they have the this uh, practice called the mummification, wherein the brain was removed through the nostrils and replaced with raw sins. Because they see this or they see the brain or they view the brain as not as important as compared with the heart. Okay, that's why they do this procedure. Okay, let's proceed to the significant people no, that have contributed on biopsych. Hippocrates, you might know him from his contribution of the four uh, humors, no? And for him, he suggests that the brain was the source of intelligence, okay? And he correctly identified epilepsy as originating in the brain, wherein he referred it as muscular convulsions. For Aristotle, he believed that the heart was the source of intellect, whereas Herophilus, who is often referred as the father of anatomy, believed that the ventricles or the fluid-filled cavities in the brain played this important role. Okay, and for Galen, he believed that the ventricles played an important role in transmitting messages to and from the brain. Okay, the ideas of Galen in regards with the ventricles and fluid transmission gained support from the French philosopher René Descartes. So for Descartes, his notable support of the mind-body dualism. So he believed that the bodies of both humans and animals work mechanically or separately. No, it's individual. It's not the same. However, Descartes believed that human beings had unique capacities that they did not share with other animals and that this work contained, contained in the mind. So I guess this is about intellect and logical and critical thinking skills that human beings don't share with animals. Okay, but for modern neurosciences, they are based mostly on the idea or the philosophical perspective of monism. So this perspective is viewed uh, as is the mind is the product of the activity in the brain and the nervous systems. 
So they view it as as uh, they work similarly or they work um, together, no? Or they work as one. Both the mind and the body work together. Unlike mind-body dualism, that this two parts, the mind and the body, is work separately or mechanically, independently. So, the monism perspective proposes that the mind is the result of the activity in the brain, which can be studied scientifically. Now, for Descartes, he was quite influential, now, even today. Some people st still struggle with the idea that the factors such as personality, brain, and logic simply represent the activity of neurons in the brain. So even up until this time, these two things are quite... Uh, pinag-uusapan ba siya? No? They're still debating whether the function of the brain and the body are under the influence of dualism or monism. So let's go to the contributions of Galvani and Boy Raymond. They established that electricity is the mode of communication used by the nervous system. For Bell and Magendi, they determined that neurons communicate in one direction and that sensation and movement are controlled by separate pathways. Okay, let's proceed to the um, idea of the localization of function. This idea was proposed actually by Gall and Spurzheim. No? So this respectable sci scientist no, had then proposed that, this, that the uh, means structure of an individual skull could be correlated with his or her individual personality characteristics and abilities. So, phrenology. So, this is known as phrenology. So, this is a type of a pseudoscience wherein the belief that the compartments or yung mga bukol-bukol sa skull natin or sa head natin, no, it has an impact with our mental faculties, with our personal char characteristics, and our personality. So, it affects who we are right now based on those, no? yung structure ng ating ulo. So, may mga iba't ibang function daw pala yung mga ulo natin. So, like for example, kung, isang, kung yung isang person is medyo malaki yung kanyang frontal lobe, no? yung kanyang noo, hence the person is considered to be intelligent because yun nga, yung, di ba yung frontal lobe, ito yung, uh, ito yung uh, lobe of the brain responsible for memory processing and storage. That's why Ganon, no? Yung belief. Again, this is just a, f a form of pseudoscience, so there is still a lack of valid explanation and, and um, different studies to support that this actually exists, or this is actually true and factual. So, for Gall and, and Spurzheim, they proposed a more modern view of the brain as the organ of the mind, no? which are composed of interconnected, cooperative, yet relatively independent functional units. So, there, uh, there are a lot of evidences that can actually support the localization of function. Again, when we talk about lo localization, this corresponds on the function of lateralization diba? or placement. Like, for instance, the right hemisphere has different functions as compared with the left hemisphere. Okay, so in the middle 80s, no, it was Paul Broca who correlated that the damage he observed in patients with their behavior and concluded that language functions were localized in the brain. So one significant highlight is the Broca's area. So this is a part that corresponds on, on speech production. So, this is part of the brain, actually. We will discuss that thoroughly on the anatomy of the nervous system, which is specifically the brain. Localization of function in the brain became a general accepted concept. So, even right up until this time, so people or modern neuroscientists believe that every part of the brain has a different um, function or it can also um, predict the behavior of the person. It was Hollings Jackson who proposed that the nervous system was organized as a hierarchy with simpler processing carried out by lower levels and more sophisticated processing carried out by higher levels, such as the cerebral cortex. So he was the one who, who believed that there is an organization and the means of order on the nervous system. So the lower levels of functioning will be carried out and move forward to a more complex and sophisticated processes, no? like the cerebral cortex, for example. Let's proceed to contemporary scientists. No? Even uh, let's proceed to 
other significant people. Um, it was Charles Sherrington who did not only coin the term synapse. So the synapse is the gap or the point of, of communication between two neurons, but also he conducted an extensive research on reflexes and the motor systems of the brain. So when we talk about reflexes, these are the autonomic or these were the autom automatic functions of our body. Like for example, we're trying to hold a very hot object. So the receptors in our skin will give us the signal that we should not hold or that we should try to avoid touching this kind of thing because this will cause us pain. No? Uh, hence, the, this receptor sends us that signal that we should, re that we should remove ourselves from that um, object, from that hot object, in order for us not to experience pain or burned. No? So, Lewy demonstrated that chemical signaling at the synapse using an elegant research design that he claims came to him while he was asleep. No, this is quite interesting. Also, Eccles, Kans, and Huxley and Hodkin had furthered out the understanding of the neural communication. So these are the works of actual contemporary neuroscientists that we had that on which had evolved over time. So. All of these things that we are that we are learning are actually existed because of the findings and the different studies of this neuroscientist before. Okay, this are the summary table. This is found actually in your textbook. Please review this one. This is the highlights of the biopsych timeline. The different historical contributions that helped evolve the field of biopsych. Okay, let's move on to the different methods in biopsych. So in conducting experiments and different studies, of course, there are a lot of methods that can be uh, done. Like for example, histology. This is studying the microscopic structure of the nervous system. So under the microscope, we study the, the parts of the cell, the different neurotransmitters, and so much more. Also, we have autopsy. We also have CT and PET scan, computerized tomography, and positron emission tomography. We also have magnetic resonance imaging or MRI. We also have functional MRI. We also have EEG, electroencephalogram, and so much more. So I hope you could actually read the different functions of the different methods in studying biopsych. Okay, and this is the summary of the first chapter of the textbook. I want you to please read the assigned readings that I have gave you, you know, from page one up until uh, the page that, that I have given you. you know, this will really help you a lot to digest even more and learn deeper and have a more intensive understanding of this lesson. Let's now proceed to research ethics. So research ethics agreed upon by government agencies, universities, schools, and individual researchers are designed to protect both the human participants and animal subjects from harm. So actually, no, not only humans, but also the animal subjects like mice, no, like um, birds, like amphibians or reptiles or whatnot, no, they have also the rights as well in regards to research ethics. So, in addition to being protected from physical and psychological harm, human participants must not be coerced into participation. So, they should not be forced in participating the research. And their confidentiality must be strictly maintained as well. So, it should always remain a private as much as possible that they are not being named no? when in regards to conducting research. So, you can actually label them but not their actual names. Hence, giving them their own privacies. Informed consent naman, it should be fully um, discussed with the participants about the different benefits and potential risk factors that can happen during the event of the research or experiment. So that should always be open to the participants, to the human participants as much as possible. Now moving forward on the animal subjects, they also have the right of course, to be protected from unnecessary pain and suffering. So researchers must establish the need of using animal subjects and are, ob and are obligated to provide them uh, excellent housing, food, and veterinary care. So of course, they should 
also be taken care of and giving them the highest possible uh, care no and and um and protection as much as possible no of course the avoidance of pain and distress should always and also be considered for animal subjects and that will be all i hope you've learned something for the week one lesson thank you so much for listening have a great day